learning how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance playbook. And joining us now, we've got Bill Baruch, president of Blue Line Futures, and Bob Elliott, co-founder and CEO, uh, CEO and CIO of Unlimited. Thanks for being here, you guys. Really appreciate it. I want to start kind of with how we're kicking off this second quarter and the sell-off that we're seeing even though the sort of macro hasn't seemed to have changed very much, I guess with the exception of Treasury yields going a bit higher. Bob, I'm going to take you first on this. And whether you think that this sell-off is justified, should people be stepping in here to buy the dip? Well, I think there's been uh, a healthy rally that has occurred over the course of the last uh, five months or so, end of last year and early this year. And what's happened is we've really repriced expectations significantly. Just think about consensus growth expectations in the U.S. for 2024 went from well below one to now 2.2 for 2024. That's a big shift that's reflected in equity markets. And as a result, you're going to have to have even stronger outcomes uh, than what we've seen lately in order to get stocks to press higher. You combine that with higher bond yields and some concerns that the Fed is not going to move nearly as quickly as people are expecting. And this might be the start of a turning point uh, in the equity market to kick off the quarter. Bill, same question to you. I want to get you in here as well. Kind of, you know, a bit of a rough start uh, to the second quarter. What, what do you make of it, of it, Bill? Where do you think we had from here? You know, certainly coming out of uh, the holiday weekend, we had the PCE on Friday and some exuberance while following the futures on Sunday night. And I think that that really, when you have that higher open in on a Sunday night in the lower open intraday uh, from a technical basis, I, I think that can start to gain a little bit of steam to the downside. But, you know, as Bob just mentioned, I mean, we've had a heck of a little run. Uh, I mean, I'm looking at the 21 day moving average we tested it, we kissed it today, but we haven't closed below the 21 day moving average in the S&P since January 17th. In fact, we've only closed below it three times this year, including January 4th and 5th. But before that, it's been uh, November 1st. So, I mean, it's been it's been a really heck of a run. I'm not even calling this a sell off. And really, we've been anticipating a breather. And what a way we're referring to this is leveling out. I mean, if you're a uh, in a in a flight that takes off, I mean, ultimately, you just kind of level out a little bit. So I think leveling out would just be more of a healthy pullback, consolidate, chop around a little bit. Uh, and this is that time of year, you know, I know April is typically strong, but we were looking from a, uh, a cycle uh, rally basis that we could see a top that, that sort of rotates around a little bit from April and May. That's what, how we were looking at things. So um, wherever we are right now, it seems like you guys agree strategically on one sector, and that sector is energy. Um, Bill, I know you have a particular expertise there, so maybe let's start with you here. Obviously, we've seen crude oil prices uh, climbing up here. Do you think that run is going to continue, and do you chase oil oil itself, or do you play it in a different way? Yeah, I, I think oil overall, if you're looking at the futures, crude oil has has really broken out above uh, some of the previous supply zones I mean, and where resistance was. And what I'd like to see is, is to build a, a support level around $83. Now, that's pretty close, but I mean, we could have some significant uh, elevation here in the coming days and weeks if we stay out above $83. Uh, obviously, geopolitics have, have played a role in, in underpinning some of the strength. And, and we've had some new news overnight with the, with the strikes on uh, uh, Iran in the embassy in Syria. But China's data over the weekend, we've seen some, some real strength coming out of the manufacturing sector there. Uh, and then on top of that, I, I think some of the, some, there's something interesting going on within the currency space as, as China defends the, the yuan. So I think there's a lot of macro tailwinds that are coming abroad that could help uh, continue to lift commodities in general. But you know, one of the ways we're playing is managing, managing the risk and have been positioning and, and call spreads that we sort of continue to roll up and, and roll out in, in our commodity trading advisor. Uh, and that's how we're able to capture this with, with some limited risk as we rally. And Bob, I want to bring you back here as well. I, I know you like uh, the energy sector as well, Bob. A big, big sector, of course. Where, where specifically, Bob, where, where do you see value? Well, I think broadly across the energy sector, it's been the most unloved stock sector uh, over the course of the last you know, 12 to 18 months, uh, particularly seeing asset managers uh, building meaningful short positions, for instance, across the hedge fund industry, and flows into the ETFs related to the companies, also basically the weakest sector that we've seen. I think in a lot of ways, the market action um, is setting up for a possible short squeeze there as uh, as there's so many short or underweight positions in place 
uh, at a time when, you know, not really for economic reasons, but uh, for supply constraint reasons, as well as geopolitical tensions, we're starting to get a spike up, uh, another leg up here in oil. And you put that together, you could create that short squeeze and a positive performance for both the stocks and the commodities themselves. Interesting, Bob. At the, at the same time, I also want to get you to sort of play off of what Bill was saying about China, because I know you have a view on what's going on there currently. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how you think that's going to play into or not play into what's going on with energy. Well, everyone here in the West is uh, hoping for the great Chinese recovery. We've been hoping for several years. And the reality is that it's just more of the same. For whatever reason, from a policy-making uh, perspective. Chinese authorities have decided that mediocre growth is more is is acceptable and are prioritizing exchange rate stability rather than engaging in domestic monetary easing that's necessary uh, to support or accelerate the economy. And so when you look across uh, all the stats, whether it's the PMIs, they've been flat for a couple of years. Uh, you look at the commodities that China meaningfully influences like ore and steel. Uh, and you're seeing those fall to, you know, post-COVID lows. Um, you know, it's not a great picture for the Chinese markets. And that small equity pop that we saw took huge buying from the national team just to get a modest recovery in equities. So I, I look at China, I sort of say a lot more of the same and that hope uh, that so many investors have brought that it would accelerate in the course of uh, 2024 doesn't look like it's going to happen. Bill, I want to get you out of here with a question on gold, which is also, listen, making headlines, hitting records. What is driving that, Bill, and do you want to own the metal or the miners? We absolutely do want to own the metal. Uh, I mean, we own it across all portfolios in, in what we're doing in the commodity space. We own it as an allocation within our, our equity buckets and, and the securities and wealth portfolios as well. Um, I mean, overall, I, I think it's a very interesting week in how we started. I mean, typically, when you see treasuries lower and meaning yields higher, uh, gold has been been uh, brought down with that. I mean, even yesterday we had a, a uh, stronger U.S. dollar and higher rates, yet gold was able to sort of power higher. Um, Silver started to wake up a little bit. I, I think that the interesting thing today is is what what's really bringing the the weakness in the in the Treasury space and, and higher yields. I, I wonder if we're starting to see selling maybe from the bricks and, and Treasuries, and they're and they're really continuing to buy more gold. Uh, I think with the dollar, um, you know, dollar a little bit weaker today. There was definitely news overnight that the, that China was selling dollars, buying yuan. So I think there's some really interesting things going on in in the precious metal space. But it's not just been gold. Again, you know, silver is starting to wake up and, and moving up against a barrier at twenty six dollars here as we speak. If silver could break out, I mean, I think that really fuels the next leg in gold. I wouldn't be surprised in this sort of narrative if we see a very significant move in, in, in gold and silver even higher from here. Now, I, I think for the viewers out there, if you're looking to capture something like this, you got to you know, make sure you manage your risk because there is a lot of volatility I expect to come with that. Bill, Bob, we're going to leave it there. Thank you guys for joining the show. Appreciate it. While we're wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with 